writers, agents, and publishers, for the first time since the Gutenberg Press, find themselves lost in a maze of mystery as technology alters the shape of the publishing industry. Searching for Answers is a group of writers throwing pop culture, writing, and publishing into a crucible of clarity, passion, and humor. This group is the Right Pack. In this episode, we are starting the first of two parts, discussing everything about agents. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Right Pack Radio. This is your host, producer, and so forth, David Allen Lucas, president of St. Louis Writers Guild, president of Winding Trails Media, published author of short fiction, still trying to get himself in the novel area. And with me today is not my lovely co-host, because she is off this episode, but with me is the one and only artist herself, the grand mastery, master of the illustrations. I am not the only artist, but I am for hire. <laughs> there you go. My name is Jennifer Stolzer. I'm a children's book author and illustrator. I have a fantasy novel that I've self-published without an agent. It's available on Amazon currently called Threadcaster. And I have a couple picture books that I've self-published without an agent that is also that are also available online on Amazon. And all of those are available at Main Street Books. If you would like to get a signed copy, then go through Main Street Books because I've signed every copy they have on their shelf. And you're also supporting a, an independent bookstore. Exactly. And also with me is my lovely wife. Hi, I'm Melanie Lucas. I am currently working on a novel, and no, I haven't tried to get an agent because I understand you don't really try and get an agent for a fiction novel until, you know, it's done. <laughs> so, yeah. And that's a good point. We'll talk about it later. Mm -hmm. Also with me is the president of Missouri Writers Guild. Yes, uh, my name is George Soroy. As David said, I am the president of the Missouri Writers Guild until May 19th, and then I'm uh, passing on the reins to... Uh, to another uh, lucky person, um, <laughs> and I look forward to uh, seeing as many people as possible at the Missouri Writers Guild Annual Writers Convention, uh, Writers Conference, I'm sorry, I'm a little tired, being a father has something to do with that, um, and um, yeah, we look forward to seeing you at the Hilton Garden Inn in Columbia, Missouri on Saturday, May 19th, uh, it's going to be a great time, and um, I'm also the author of science fiction for the young adult reader, including um, Excelsior, which is currently available on um, paperback, ebook, and audiobook. Uh, the five part uh, serial from Parts Unknown, um, which is currently available in paperback and ebook. And the upcoming Ever Upward Part Two in the Excelsior Journey coming out spring 2018. Yes, spring 2018. Mm -hmm. I am promise you, it is coming out in spring 2018. It's your fault. You're the winter winter, winter, winter is never ending. Right. You're Jack Frost, and, uh, you and your production schedule. Yeah, who knew, right? Um, but uh, for more information, just go to my website at www.he'sgotit.com. Excellent. Also with us today is the Sky Pirate Admiral of Steampunk himself. I'll take it. Yes, I'm Brad R. Cook. I'm the author of the Iron Chronicles, uh, Steam Tree, the Erdranium Adventures, and now Tales of the Gear Blade. Uh, and also, I'm announcing this here, and uh, you know, it's everywhere as well. Mm -hmm. uh, if you are a writer person out there, uh, which if you're listening to this, you probably are, uh, I now also do a bunch of other stuff that I've been doing for years in the background, uh, and now I'm kind of opening it up for freelance and stuff like that. So if you want a book cover, I do custom book covers. They're really cool. You can go check them out. Uh, and if you need formatting for ebooks or print books, print books more importantly, because that's where the, uh, the, the crazy real, uh, you know, room of meat of all that laying out is. Uh, there's a whole ton of other stuff, including websites and web design signs and postmarks, bookmarks, rack cards, all kinds of fun stuff. Check it all out. It's at bradarkup.com and at uh, broadswordbooks.blogspot.com All right. And also, too, since George mentioned Missouri Writers Guild Conference, I would be negligent to mention Gateway Con. Not to mention. Not to mention <laughs> Gateway Con. Sorry for the audience. After a four-plus-hour drive today to get to the 
recording today. Like George, I'm tired. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Apparently, everyone is tired. Yeah, yeah well, think. Gateway Con. The Gateway to Publishing Conference and Convention, which includes a full-blown writer's conference with agents that you can pitch to, as well as publishers, a free and open to the public book fair, and a free writer's retreat. For details, go to www.stlwritersguild.org and click on Gateway Con. It will take you to more. All the information. This occurs from June 15th through 17th, 2018. And if you miss this year, well, there will be next year. And with that today, we're going to talk about agents. And we're going to talk about everything to do about agents that we can talk about. This is part one of two parts of a two-part episode. So, agents. In the current industry, we've got a change. And this this is part of the things that drives Right Pack Radio itself. We've had an industry revolution that occurred, oh, I could be wrong with the dates, but I'm going to call it 10 years ago, just to play devil's advocate, plus or minus five years on that. Um, just because I'm, I really can't pin it, where people have stopped necessarily thinking they thinking to rely on agents to get their works published, self publishing or indie publishing has become a thing, where it's become more of a more legitimate than it used to be back before the internet and before Amazon came around. So, why do people before need Amazon? Agents? Yeah, before Amazon, mm-hmm. definitely. Why do people need agents? What do, what good are agents? You know, start from there. Brad, you got your indication you want to talk. Yeah, uh, to throw it out there, it's probably uh, Hugh Howry and Amanda Hawking. Uh, if you really want to put a date on when this explosion happened, you're probably looking at their publication dates when both of them ended up making tons and tons of money off of their self-published books. Uh, they were really some of the first to make tons and tons of money off their self-published books. Uh, if you want to, go read about it. There's a ton of blogs out there. I'm certain I remember reading a ton back when <laughs> that was happening. Uh, anyway, uh, so I wanted actually to start off today by talking about what an agent is. Uh, there's A literary agent is something that is, is important in this industry, and I do think that they are important, and I know that we have people who do not agree with me on that, uh, but I still say that they are the gatekeepers of publishing. And yes, they are not the only avenue you have to walk down. That is a very important thing to know. Very true. What is, I, I, you know, I thank you to everyone who came to my workshop for St. Louis Writers Guild uh, on uh, pitching to agents and stuff like that. I'll be doing it again at Gateway Con uh, for those of you who are going to be there. Um, So you'll learn to pitch to an agent. But here's the thing. I always tell people to start at the top. And that means starting with a query letter to an agent. Because if you are the next J.K. Rowling, if you are the next Stephen King, they've got the best career options lined up for you. And when I say that, I mean being in a top five house. I cannot get into, uh, you know, Penguin or Harper or Tor or any of those. I can't. As much as I'm a great writer and all that kind of fun stuff, it's never going to happen because they don't accept unsolicited manuscripts. So the biggest thing an agent can do for you is give you an unsolicited man or get you into one of those houses. Um, two, an agent does for you. They are your contract negotiators. Uh, contracts are horrible, and writers are really bad at them. And I mean that in the most loving sense because. When we get to the contract stage, we already feel like we've been given the brass ring. And how can you turn away from that because there's a really horrible contract in front of you? So too often we get seduced as writers into horrible contracts. An agent is your pit bull. They'll fight for your rights. They'll fight for your abilities. They'll fight for all of that kind of stuff. And yes, that does get them 15%. Um, So that's just in in a little clue as to what an agent does. An agent does a ton of other things in terms of negotiating rights and Hollywood and all kinds of, you know, fun stuff like that. But um, the biggest things they do is get you into houses you can't get into and negotiate your contracts for you. I want to kind of go off on a little bit of that. There are a lot of good, a lot of good 
small publishers out there in this world. They've really grown up thanks to the internet and thanks to the ability to be able to promote books that they were not able to have pre-2000. But one thing an agent will do, an agent is not necessarily required to get you into a small publisher, but Brad, what you brought up about contracts is a number one thing with agents. There are a lot of predators out there as well uh, that are call themselves presses. We normally call them vanity presses, but they will try to go by other names to hide their predatory nature. Agents know who not to go to as well as who to go to, who, who your work's going to fit with. So that's just something I want to throw out there when it comes to contracting. <laughs> Excuse me, as we have an emergency at Right Pack Radio called Cats. Um, but anyway, what I was going to go with that is you're, you, have a, you, have some, you have an expert in the industry who knows what to look for and what not to look for. George, I'm going to go over to you as I deal with my situation here. Yeah, there, uh, one other thing that, uh, another thing that agents from what I understand are very valuable for as well is um, is also negotiating other deals on top of you know working with just the publisher. They don't just work you know work with the publisher. They can also you know like work with um, there's there's one now uh, there's one management company that's talent management company that's out there um, called M uh, MLM. And basically, what they do is they not only have they not only have agents there, but they also um, work w for film and television rights as well. So they also work with you know negotiating that way. It's it's a means of getting you um, much further than where you can by yourself. You know that's that's one you know great thing about about an agent. It's something that uh, kind of reflect on what Brad was saying how. They definitely earn their fifteen percent, you know, because right. you know, when they are going that extra mile that you just can't go, they can go, you know, maneuver these types of the types of barriers that are out there that you just can't when you're doing it by yourself. Um, so they can handle film and television negotiations. They can handle foreign rights. Uh, they can handle. Um, they can basically like kind of get you into. A lot of places, especially you know, like, like Brad said, with the big five, you know, like that's they want to earn their money, you know, by getting their, you know, by getting their fifteen percent, and there's only so much that you can earn them by working with like a small press. So it's also something to keep in mind. Jen, and then back to Brad. Go ahead, Jen. Uh, I wanted to make a point that we mentioned uh, that there are authors out there that have self-published and have sold lots and lots and lots of books. Yes. And are very uh, very successful in their self-publishing, as successful as a, a, a represented author would be. But I wanted to make a note that those people, when they go to get a book deal, uh, or to get a movie deal or a TV deal, uh, they've got representation before they do that. Right. Like, all of those people have been picked up by, uh, not all, I'm making generalizations, which is bad of me, um, Many of those very successful self-publishing stories ended with them being picked up by a big house. And they were picked up by a big house by being picked up by an agent who then managed them with their big house. So it led there anyway. Right. Brad? Yeah, uh, I mean, it's a good point. But I think the big point to point out to our, our listeners here in terms of going after an agent is that it, it really does fall under what kind of uh, book you've written. Um, you know, obviously the big five publishers, the main publishing houses are all looking for certain kinds of books. Uh, you know, stuff that's going to have mass appeal, the stuff you see in bookstores, the stuff you see in Barnes and Nobles and stuff like that. Uh, you know, the, the giant biographies, uh, any celebrities book, you know, anything like that is, is obviously going to be the, the big draw. Um, but that also means that if you've written YA or romance or any of these others, you have a really good mystery or thrillers or, uh, and such. You have a really great opportunity of getting an agent. Um, however, and this is one of the thing to point out, if you've written more of a niche book, 
uh, something that is uh, smaller per se, or doesn't have that massive appeal wide audience thing. Um, there are tons of, as we've talked about the smaller presses and such that might be a better fit for your book. Um, however, that doesn't necessarily mean you shouldn't have an agent because an agent, the other thing they do is, uh, help you guide your career. And when I say that, I mean, you know, ensuring that the books you write are the types of things that readers are looking for, um, you know, in terms of trends and things of that nature. Uh, they're not going to tell you what to write. That's not the way that works. Um, however, there are, you know, uh, they know what people are looking for and they know what readers and how the trends are going. They see a lot more data and statistics than we do. Right. Jen? Well, let's take the conversation in a different direction a little bit. Uh, no, we go haven't. Go, go, go. go ahead. We, let's, we've just talked about what an agent does and how, very briefly, on how to get one. Mm hmm. If I were trying to find the proper agent, because there were, there you know niche, niche things mm. might have an agent out there looking for it. There are ways to find out where your agent that you're looking for is. Pitching my mystery book to someone who only does children's literature and picture books is probably going to get me a no. So how do I, the the cabbage-headed writer who's never pitched to an agent before? find the right agent to pitch to to increase my likelihood of getting a yes. Let me pause that for a second. This is, I like where this is going. We constantly are talking about pitching, so I'm going to say, if you're interested in pitching, we have talked about pitching in the past in multiple episodes, but we do have a dedicated episode strictly to pitching, and guess what it's called? Pitching your story. Um, you, you can find it in our backlog, wherever you're at, on Blog Talk, iTunes, TuneIn, um, or YouTube. I don't think I said YouTube. They're all available out there. You should be able to find it. So, going with your question there, or going with your statement, people, please. <laughs> Brad, and then George. Well, I would say, first off, I'd throw out that when we're talking about pitching, we're also kind of talking about querying, which is right. the query letter that you're firing off to an agent in order to get an agent uh, it's a pitch too. Um, anyway, so Jen's asking the how, and uh, I would throw out that my favorite of this is QueryTracker.net. Um, we've dropped it a million times. We've done whole episodes on you know how to do this. So go back and check the backlogs because it's awesome. Uh, but QueryTracker.net is an amazing website. It has a whole free component. Um, but you can go there. You can type in the agent. Uh, it'll bring up. Uh, what they represent, how they like their submissions. Um, if you get into the paid side, uh, you can then give your experiences over and have Query Tracker literally track all your queries for you, uh, hence the name. Um, but they also do uh, publishers, um, so it is a great resource to go to if you are looking for an agent who publishes, or who an agent looking to represent your genre. Um, so do check that out. There are a ton of others. Uh, there's uh, Agent Query, and then there is uh, there are more. I don't remember them all. I just used Query Tracker. So mm -hmm. okay, yeah, there is of course Writer's Digest has a yeah. system you can pay for it. By the way, Writer's Digest. Let me go through another part that you get to it. And George, I know you've still got your hand up back there. Um, Writer's Digest publishes their information on agents and editors. That stuff is still usable. It is, unlike Query Tracker and anything else online, it's obsolete the moment it hits print, but the obsolescence that is faced by those is not the lifetime, the life, the life of their information changes maybe about every three to five years not instantaneously every five minutes. So there's nothing wrong with being able to go out there to a bookstore, buy a copy of Writer's Market, that's what it's called. Or if you're more frugal, unlike my wife believing what I'm about to say, if you're more frugal like I am, you will go to the library to get the latest copy. George, go ahead. 
Yeah, you, you beat me to it regarding the uh, Writer's Digest, but I will say that, uh, that the, the key, the, the main word that we're trying to put out here is a simple word, which is research. Mm -hmm. You want to make sure that you are looking online to see what, what kind of agent will accept what you have. That's the main thing that you really need to really need to keep in mind. There are a lot of books like um, uh, David said that are out there, you know, like that will, uh, like the uh, Writer's Digest Guide to Literary Agents. It's one of the smaller versions of the Writer's Market, more kind of like central based on on the agents themselves. But they'll have you know genres and everything that that you know that you'll be able to track by. They have uh, locations you'll be able to track by. Um, whether you feel comfortable working with an agent that is way if you're living in Missouri and that agent is off in California and if you're comfortable with that you know great it's a wonder of the internet you know that yeah. that, that makes everything a whole lot closer so um one thing that I would just definitely say is just like just um just do your research make sure that that what you are that what you have matches what they're looking for Brad that is definitely the first step in getting an agent that wants your material. <laughs> yep. Is looking for an agent who represents the type of book you've written. Um, I, I would highly recommend going after an agency. Uh, maybe not just an agent. Um, an agency has multiple agents and uh, they do different things. Some will handle foreign rights, some will handle uh, Hollywood rights, some will handle you know the different things, uh, contract negotiations, the looks and stuff like that. They're all experts. They're all, you know, uh, have, you know, expertise in certain areas. Uh, so that can be a wonderful thing to be in an agency. Also, if you write more than one type of book that does not uh, come together, say you've been, you're a kid's author and now you've written this really cool biography. Well, if you're a part of an agent who represents kids, they're not going to want, they don't really know what to do with your biography. Right. Uh, but if it's an agency, there might be another agent in there who does represent biographies, ergo can represent that book, and now you're making all kinds of money. Uh, so that can be a wonderful thing. I, I highly recommend going after agencies. Uh, it is also um, a good way to avoid the bad agent. Uh, there are people who misrepresent themselves as literary agents as a way of taking your money. Um, the most common way of this, and uh, <laughs> The one I find the most scrupulous, unscrupulous, is uh, they will take you on as a client and then get your book into a pay-for-profit like house. So the agent, then you now have to pay X number of dollars to your publisher to get published. Um, it's the worst in, of the ways. But there are also agents who literally just shop you out to whatever small press you could have gotten yourself into as well. Yeah. Um, at that point, that's not really the point of having an agent. Um, other than the contract negotiations and all the other things that they do, um, I do not have a problem with agents or setting out to medium houses, small houses, niche houses. They're supposed to land your book. And if they can, that's a huge part. Um, but there are unscrupulous agents who will charge reading fees, charge you all kind of money. Um, just put a great, there's a great post out from Writer's Digest about how money needs to go to the author, not from the author. I highly recommend checking it out. It's like the 13 reasons to avoid something. Uh, it's in St. Louis Writers Guild's Facebook page right now. Okay, actually let's go with that. Um, Jen and I actually both had our same, same thoughts go through as Brad was talking. Let's talk about what not to expect from an agent briefly. And one of those things is you shouldn't be having to pay money up front for an agent to do work for you. Agents collect their money on the back end. Or rather, once you're selling your book they're, and getting royalties, they're collecting money. So, what are some other things that you should... The industry as a whole, like, all of publishing collects money on the back end. Yes. It's a, it's a giant collective experiment of put your money where your mouth is. You pay, you know, the, the publisher and whoever pays up front intend to print out books 
to then recoup the sales from people buying them. And that money then gets disseminated throughout everyone on every stage of, of the publishing industry, including your agent and including you. Mm -hmm. So when you're doing small presses as well, paying up front is not the way that goes. You get paid by selling, and that encourages everybody to sell your book. Right. It really does. And that's a big thing. Um, also, too, agents don't, even though we're all talking about selling your book, agents don't go out and sell your book to bookstores or to readers. Their job mm -hmm. is to sell it to the publishers. Yeah, your agent is not your publicist either. Right. Ding, 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 ding. That should be the headline of this episode. <laughs> yeah. Your agent is not your publicist. But why not? I mean, why, why don't they do that? I'm playing Cabbage Head, by the way. <laughs> FYI. Because your, your publicist has an entirely different set of jobs yes. than your agent. And technically, they should be doing those jobs at the same time. <laughs> right. Yes. Your agent should be selling your next book as your publicist is selling your current book. Dang. Yeah, there, the audience is completely different. Let me put this in a completely different realm, if you will. If you're going to go play soccer, you want a good coach who is going to help you improve on kicking the ball, not how to swing a golf club. Your agent is always focused on getting you that next deal. Your publicist is focused on your current book, getting it out to get the market to sell. And that's why I'm using those, using that, the two different skill sets is what I was trying to point out. Go ahead. And uh, since I know this isn't a talk about publicists, right? but I think it's important since we're on the topic to mention that not that your agent doesn't come with a publicist most of the time. Right. And your publisher doesn't come with a publicist most of the time. That is a separate person that you're going to find to hire to do this thing for you. And it's... When it's, you get big, it's the president of your fan club. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Uh, there are many ways you can do that. We can talk about that on a future episode. But a lot of people that I talk to get an agent thinking the agent is going to act on their behalf for that kind of thing, that they're right. going to post on their social medias and they're going to arrange book signings and tours and things, and that's not what an agent is for. Exactly. Some of them will help because they love you, because the, the whole, the hope is that you're, you have a friendship business relationship with your agent and you both want to succeed together, but don't get an agent for the purpose of having someone to help you with that portion, get a publicist. Right. With the intent of getting someone to help you to with that portion of publishing. And let me throw in here too, I, I love what you just said in regards to the relationship with an agent. So let me throw this part out to it. You can be buddy buddy with your agent. Mm -hmm. Okay. But one thing that you really need to remember is they're a business partner. It's as much as they may be a good may turn into a good strong Friendship going on there, you need to remember to treat them always as your business partner, not as your best friend who you just you just had a big fight with your spouse and now you're calling up your agent to cry about that fight. That's not what they're there for. If anybody disagrees with me, please say so, but otherwise... If you no, but they are there if you've just gotten off the phone with your publisher and you're crying yes. your eyes out. <laughs> then you call up your agent, you ball and ball and ball, and then, you know, they do something about it. So, mm -hmm. exactly. Not your spouse, but if your publisher, which th these are all the same relationships anyways. Yes. <laughs> and that's also something, too, an agent will walk you through, a good agent will walk you through the publishing steps. If you're independent, you have to take on all the publishing steps on your own. Arrange for somebody to get a good book cover. Hopefully you get an illustrator who knows what a good book cover looks like. 
Jennifer Stolzer really does know what a good book cover looks like. Just as, give me a hint, and so does Brad. As does Brad Cook, who is currently... Who is, I was just yeah. saying. Who is yeah. launching. Those. So if you're wanting an illustrated one, you got to go after Jen or hire me, and then I'll hire Jen. Right. Yeah, you can split the difference and <laughs> yeah. get me to illustrate something that he then puts together. I won't right. be offended exactly. if you decide exactly. to do it. I totally have that. Exactly. That's a fair like, thing. You're getting Jen. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and then also, too, the time it will take you to go through the edits... Get to the galleys, and if you don't know what that galley is, it's a good sign that you might want to do some research uh, to know that aspect and to get it out eventually to an arc and then out to the actual public. Arc being an advanced reader copy. copy. Right. Um, and this all takes time. This takes time and effort. A good agent will help you through those steps and guide you through those steps and maybe not let you lose your mind in those steps. And keep you on track. Right. Now, yes. warning, you may not always get the book cover that you want. If you have doubts, look at Angie Fox's first um, book. The Well, book covers are entirely controlled by the publisher. Exactly. So. And that's the, with that point blank. But, but the you, author does get some some say. Yes. And if you wanted to fight with your publisher about your cover, the yes, agent will help you with that. <laughs> exactly. And that's the beauty part, because you'll be like, God, I hate that cover. This is the worst cover I've ever seen. But I don't want to tell my publisher that, because they're really nice and friendly, and I want to have a nice working relationship with them for like the next umpteen years. So your agent goes forward and goes, yeah, this is a horrible cover. This is really ugly. You're going to redesign this. We don't care that you spent a thousand dollars on it. You're going to spend another thousand dollars and get a really good cover. <laughs> and then they'll go, uh, and then they'll be like, you know, then your agent fires back. Well, no, you're going to do this. And then they're like, okay, we're going to do it. Fine. You get a new cover. So this is what agents do, because if you were an author, you would never get that. You'd an author would call up and be like, I don't like the cover. And they'd be like, yeah, we don't care. Yep. And yeah. I'm <laughs> Let me go with that briefly because I, I have an example. I don't believe the person who I'm referring to, I'm not going to mention names, but I don't believe they listened to us. But even if they did, maybe this would help them. <laughs> there is a author who I know who likes to promote their book to be like Harry Potter. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, if, if you've written a book that's in the Harry Potter-esque feel, cool, go for it. But when I look at their cover, I get the Alice in Wonderland feel. It is not a cover that fits. And where I'm going with that is an agent is a specialist in your genre, and they will they'll look at your cover as well and go, uh, yeah, there's a problem here. This doesn't fit. Well, since we're we're talking about this this possible scenario. Uh, take this as an example for all steps in publishing. Yes. If you have a problem with the title that they picked, then there's this fight that's going to go on again. Mm -hmm. If you have a trouble, if you have trouble with uh, some of the edits that they're suggesting, this is the fight that goes on again. Uh, it, it, this is how this happens. But I also wanted to point out that as a an independent person who is enlisting the publishing mm -hmm. services of maybe a small house or a middle house that doesn't require representation, you will still have this fight. It's just yes. that you're the one fighting it. Mm -hmm. and I've heard from lots of, uh, of people, even just recently, that have been in long email and phone battles with their publishers because the publisher is making a decision that they think it's very unwise and they're doing everything they can to try and get it undone before it then reflects badly on them as an author. And it's very stressful. And if they had an agent, then the agent would take 15% of, of that small business arrangement, but they would then be your intermediary and be the one answering those emails for you and giving you the bottom line and asking for a yes or no answer instead of having to email back and forth with people who are all trying to get their way. And along those lines, and this is exactly where you're going, the agent is also able to explain maybe better than the publisher as to why the publisher is going down a certain route. Mm -hmm. Whereas you yourself may, okay, true story, and just not sharing names, a certain author who got represented by a small publisher, not by an agent, wrote a science fiction story set, uh, basically dinosaurs roaming around time. <laughs> and they wanted a dinosaur to look like Barney. 
Yes, the purple month, purple dinosaur. <laughs> we love you. You love me. Blah blah blah. Um, and first off, the publisher tried their darn just to explain why they don't want to have Barney on the cover. Number one, copyright infringement, trademark infringement. Um, and number two, definitely not the market in which the book was written for. So I'm not going to name names because I'm not going to break that part of it, but there's some example right there. Um, so with agents, what else, what other goods, good services do agents provide to authors? I know um, agent... Agent Extraordinaire, Donald Mayus. And Donald, if I mispronounce your name, I apologize. I've even met you, but I may not pronounce correctly, so forgive me. Um, has compared authors to sitting inside of a plane. Your super published authors like James Patterson, Stephen King, Walter Mosley etc. are all up in the first class section of the plane. Most authors who are going through either an agent or your top, your not quite upper echelon, but your stronger independent authors fall into second class or business class and everybody else falls into third class. So how do agents help you get through all that? And Brad, you might not be answering the question, but you're up next. Go for it. <laughs> uh, no, I'm, I'm not really answering that question because I don't really know. Um, <laughs> Fair enough. To be honest, though, like I, I guess to throw out something of an answer in terms of your airplane metaphor, what an agent does for you is to ensure that you make it in first class because it's the only way to get into first class. Right. Um, you know, uh, and then to help you stay there by keeping your deals going and negotiating all these deals. Because remember, like a lot of times you'll get that one book deal and that one book deal turns into a three book deal and that three book deal turns into a five book deal. You know, that's the way a lot of big series go. So um, uh, in terms of that, that's much better like an agent to negotiate while you're writing. <laughs> um, yeah. Always a plus. But the real thing I wanted to bring up is what some of the things an agent does for you that are behind the scenes that we don't know about. Um, first off being, uh, for anyone who's not actually agented yet or is writing or doing whatever, uh, the first one I throw out is that they have wonderful workshops. Um, Writer's Digest puts the agents up all the time to do query letter workshops, opening workshops, how to hook people, how to make, you know, uh, it, Dave just brought up Donald Mass, uh, who does a great one on uh, writing the breakout novel. He's got a whole book on it. Uh, actually, two, so, you know, two good books on huh? it. Yeah, actually, yeah, no, no kidding. So um, they are a wonderful resource for writers who are trying to finish novels and get in there. If you don't follow them on Twitter, I highly recommend that because they're constantly talking about books and talking about, like, you know, what works and what doesn't work and what they want to see and what they don't want to see. And, um, and then if you're not on, like, Tumblr where they do the Ask Anythings, and you can just ask questions away. Uh, those are amazing to read through and so much fun. The other thing, this is the big one though. So there are publishing conventions out there that we as writers don't necessarily go to. Um, BEA being the biggest, which is Book Expo America, which is in New York and is the Comic-Con, San Diego Comic-Con of book world. So if you ever wanted to go and cosplay up like crazy, uh, BEA might be for you. It's where all of the publishers show up. They have giant displays and giant booths and every book that's coming out next year and the year after that is there on display and publishers are talking about that. And here's what agents do. They walk around and talk to all the publishers and figure out what the publishers are looking to publish next year. And it's a whole conversation that begins. Um, this happens not just at BEA, but all over. Uh, it is where the industry, if you think of it like the fashion industry, uh, the book industry is the same. Where the top tier, where the 1% kind of drives the rest of the industry follows in the wake. Um, it's the same, same thing as in the fashion industry for the publishing industry. So decisions made at BEA 
and at uh, IBPA and at the Midwest Posting Association and at the big one over in London that happens every year that I can't even remember the name of, and then at the ALA, and there's they all have amazing anagrams. Uh, but the point is, is that this is where the industry makes decisions on, you know, what colors covers are going to be and where uh, trends are headed in terms of what people are reading. And that's not, the, I mean, that is for the next coming year, but that sets up for the next year following and like the next three to five years in publishing. Right. So it's, it's, it's an amazing thing that they do on their side of the business side of writing. Writers are amazing at putting words together that are beautiful and create stories and characters that we will love for generations. Hopefully. They're not so great at the business side where all the nuts and bolts come together and where books actually get put together and all the trends get set and all of that. So that is a business side. There, there are always two sides of writing to me. There is the writing side and then there's the business side of, of the publishing industry. And they are masters of the business side. And, you know, it allows a writer to focus on being a writer. Right. Really fast, I just want to go, th and I'm going to turn this over to Jen. And we'll end up closing out with Jen's comment um, the end of part one. Next week will be part two. But really fast, if you have that streak in you, it's like, no, I will not go down an agent path. I refuse to. Hey, I, and, and as, I know I sound like I'm making fun of you. I'm not. <laughs> Honestly, I'm not. If you really are going down that path, what Brad has just said about the agents is one of your number one sources for understanding the niche industry in which you are in. Just because you don't want to go down that traditional path doesn't mean you can't profit from understanding the business and that they are seeing out there. A book to go through a traditional publisher takes approximately two years plus or minus on that but two years is a good rule of thumb agents are looking beyond that and so should you from your business end of a writing industry and if you are an independent writer no just publishing your book and expecting the world to find it is not going to happen you have got to take on the role of all the business on that over to you, Jen. Again, we're of like mind today, David. I was going to point out that there are some people that actually are good at the, the business end uh -huh. as well as good at the putting words together end, and they have a passion for both, or at least a passing interest in both. Mm -hmm. And that that might make you a good candidate to go uh, fly free agentless. Right. Because then you'll be able, you know, you'll have full control over everything, which people who who know a lot about both ends and have a passion to do it themselves tend to want to have control over all the aspects, mm -hmm. your cover, your, your interior, your advertising, your web space, uh, all of that. Uh, you will have to take control of it if you go by yourself. You'll have to be in charge of all of those things. But if you're up for that challenge, then you, you may also benefit from having an agent uh, if you think about it. Because you will be able to use all of that prowess that you have to enhance the benefit of being represented on a top tier level. And on that note, we're going to pause here. Tune in next week for part two. Have a great week writing. And please, like and subscribe on whatever platform you listen to us on and share it with your other writer's friends. And to those who have commented about how we've helped you with your writing or we are part of your personal writing community you could not touch our hearts more mm -hmm. thank you take care the new theme songs for right pack radio were written and performed by meredith tate all copyrights remain with her Writers, agents, and publishers, for the first time since the Gutenberg Press, find themselves lost in a maze of mystery as technology alters the shape of the publishing industry. Searching for Answers is a group of writers throwing pop culture, writing, and publishing into a crucible of clarity, passion, and humor.